So, uh, good, good evening and a very, very warm welcome to each one of you for this post budget tax webinar organized by the Taxation Accountancy Com Committee of the Bombay Chamber. On behalf of the Bombay Chamber, I would like to express my sincere thanks to our esteemed speakers for taking time out from the busy schedule and addressing us on the key tax amendments in the union budget and their in implication on the industry. Today, uh, we have a very esteemed panel. Uh, we have Ms. Renuka Narvekar, Global Head Taxation, Tata Consultancy Services Limited, and she is also the co-chairperson of the Direct Tax Committee of Bombay Chamber. Mr. Kalpesh Desai, partner KPMG, deal advisor, mergers and acquisition tax and private equity tax. Mr. Shravan Kumar, Executive Vice President, Accounts and Taxation, Larson and Chubro Limited. Mr. Keu Shah, partner, Ernst & Young, LLP. Mr. Frank D'Souza, Chartered Accountant, Price Waterhouse and Company, LLP India. And uh, this is being moderated by uh, Ms. Rajeshri Subnavis, partner, uh, Rajeshri Subnavis and Associates, and chairperson of our direct tax committee of the Bombay Chamber. Uh, thank you. Thank you, all of you, for being here. Uh, my special thanks to Rajeshri and Renu for putting this together uh, at such a short notice. Uh, I, before I hand it over to Rajeshri, I would also like uh, to thank our esteemed partners, Tata Consultancy Services Limited and Tata Steel for the valuable support uh, to this chamber. As all of you know, the Bombay Chamber is one of the oldest chambers in the country, uh, established in 1836 and has a long and illustrious history of continuing services to trade and industry. And uh, we've been doing this uh, very, very important uh, webinar on earlier seminar on the taxation committee the moment the budget comes out for years together. And this is one of the very well looked uh, forward to by most uh, of our uh, members. Over to you, Rajeshri. Thanks, Sandeep. Uh, a very warm welcome to all our esteemed panelists and uh, the participants uh, who joined us. Um, a very warm, I mean, very, uh, it's a uh, good evening as well. And welcome to this webinar of uh, the Bombay Chamber, the Direct Tax Committee. Um, essentially, the topic today is, as we're all aware, it's about taxes post-budget. And I think the impact was something which was very much known, seen, heard, given the way the markets reacted, given the way some of the corporates have uh, expressed uh, their concerns, their uh, uh, feedback and their reactions. Um, also, I think it's been a question of expectations, a question of delivery, a question of the situation that we are in today. And why do I say that? This is the first post-pandemic budget presented by the finance minister. And as she rose to present the first budget in the digital form, okay, really in a digital form, because she was, I mean, uh, th that's something which she did very uh, proudly announce. Uh, very much showed the intent of the government A to focus with their focus, uh, continued focus on digital economy as well as fintech, being at the core and being at the forefront of this particular government. Inclusive growth, growth, lesser uh, government interference, maximum governance, less regulations, trying to ease doing this, uh, uh, you know, probably taking steps to help ease of doing business. And of course, bringing in a lot of transparency and financial accountability across, including a thrust to the public-private partnership has been at the core of this government ever since they've taken, uh, you know, ever since in their second term. With that continued focus, uh, you know, a lot was expected, I would say. Uh, in terms of if you were to look at it from an economic uh, factor and an economic uh, standpoint, clearly this, this is a growth-oriented budget, but a lot will also have to be seen and watched in terms of how this gets implemented and executed. Given economy and then at the end of the day, revenue, numbers, taxes, which is also of paramount importance, the question really is when we come down from the 30,000 feet level to the ground level, what is it that we are really going to be dealing with? What does some of these announcements actually mean to corporate India, to the consultant fraternity, to the assessee in general, and to the common man? Have we checked all the boxes? Is it something that you know we did start off with a very good intent, but somewhere we seem to have missed the bus? 
have we really taken a step backward when it comes to uh, saying that it's maximum governance, less government interference, and of course, no retrospective amendments? Have we really uh, done that? Or is it that we've kind of gone to tweak around some of the provisions and probably uh, the impact is something which will be known and which will be tested in the years to come. On that note, uh, I would, uh, this is, you know, if you all see the panel is a very, very strong panel. You have members in, who are specialists in their own respective areas, respective fields, bringing together more than two decades or more than two to two and a half decades of experience, um, clearly having dealt with some of the issues that we will be debating and discussing today. I am privileged uh, and I uh, extend a very warm welcome to my co-chair, Renu Narvekar uh, from TCS. Sandeep has already done the introduction, so I wouldn't really spend too much of time on that. Um, we have Kayusha from Ernst & Young. I have Shavan Kumar from LNT. I have Frank D'Souza from PricewaterhouseCoopers. And I have Kalpesh Desai from KPMG, who will be discussing and debating some of the issues that we will be uh, placing across to each of the uh, panelists. And of course, so there will be a question answer session. So clearly in terms of any questions, any discussions, any doubts, please post it on the chat box and we will address that at the end of the session. Uh, so given that, let me just start and I will start with manufacturing has always been at the forefront. And I think that's something which uh, clearly this government and in fact, most of the, uh, the finance minister has also made it uh, very uh, vocal in terms of extending the uh, benefit to the manufacturing sector. Services sector, although one of the significant contributories to the economy, um, clearly is also in the forefront with some of the announcements that have been made, especially around the SEZ legislation being replaced. Uh, and also the fact, you know, given the pandemic and the experience of some of the largest IT players in, um, in the country, even globally, but let's focus on our country right now. I would uh, you know, turn to you, Renu, and uh, get your thoughts around what do you think about, you know, A, have we really addressed some of the concerns of the services sector? What do you think of the budget? And what do you think about, uh, you know, some of the hits and misses of this budget? Thanks, thanks, Rajshree. So like you rightly said, I do believe it's a growth-oriented uh, budget. And I think um, the one thing that the uh, finance minister has done, she's continued continued the continuity of focus on the growth and uh, development, right? And the focus, like you said, has been on digital and fintech. But having said that, if you remember section 115 uh, BAP, uh, this was introduced by the ordinance to tax newly established manufacturing companies, that is companies uh, set up and registered on or after October 1, 2019. And uh, those who have commenced manufacturing uh, before uh, March 2023. Uh, they were given the rate of 15% plus surcharge and says. Now this has been extended up to 31st March 23. Uh, sorry, uh, up to 24 in view of the pandemic. Uh, given the entire focus on digital and fintech, there, however, like you rightly said, there seems to be no such provision or benefit to the services sector. Uh, also, if you know, uh, the existing tax, hol tax holiday under section uh, 10 AA that is also expired on 31st March 2020. So this is actually making the Indian services sector highly uncompetitive in the international environment. Okay? Uh, the service sector has a prominent role in the Indian economy. It has a very strong multiply effect on the outcome and employment. So I think one of the biggest misses that this budget is, it uh, failed to uh, provide any boost and focus to the services sector. Okay? So given the uh, government has reduced the manufacturing corporate rate to 15%, the fact that uh, the SEZ has also sunsetted. I think at least the new services company in the SEZ, the government could have considered the same rate of 15% so that we could have at least one composite, uh, composite rate in the SEZ for both uh, manufacturing and services. Now this uh, concessional rate combined with other criteria like employment and investments over a period of time would have definitely driven uh, further growth. The other miss or I would say a recommendation that could have been exploited was the entire uh, drive for innovation and growth by setting up what we call innovation clusters, you know, where you have the design to manufacture capabilities of engineering and IT companies that could have been demonstrated. So you walk in uh, with an idea and you walk out with a prototype. And uh, such cl clusters, they do exist globally. Uh, 
and uh, this could have been a use as a great opportunity to showcase uh, india's capabilities as a sector uh, instead uh, what they have done is the weighted average uh, weighted deduction for r and d which was been discontinued for uh, 21 uh, 22 which is the erstwhile uh, section 35 2ab that is that could have been reinstated to give a boost to r and d uh, and innovation uh, the patent box could have been revamped so i think supporting the services sector would also support the government's motto of uh, make in india and digital india and i think this is one area where uh, there is a big miss definitely thanks rino <clears throat> Uh, thanks, Renu. And uh, you know, given the fact hits and misses, and of course, uh, you know what was promised, have they taken two steps back? And uh, this was, uh, you know, the promise that was made that we will be providing the taxpayers a uh, pretty much certainty in terms of when it comes to litigation, when it comes to some of the issues that have been, you know, uh, there are clearly certain positions which have been well blessed by uh, the courts. Have we kind of reopened? Uh, uh, those you know that that the, not necessarily the can of worms but just kind of you know shaken that and also the fact is when we talk about more governance less regulations are we clearly giving some additional powers in the hands of the um tax officers and when i say tax officers more from an executive standpoint and frank here is where i would like you to share uh, you know some of the uh, uh issues, i.e. around, you know, this entire 263, the reassessment proceedings, and the fact that have they just gone a step ahead and uh, clearly kind of one step backwards when it comes to saying unsettling what was already set, at least in, as far as the litigation environment is concerned. So <clears throat> on that, um, uh, they, they do talk about the fact, and I see a lot of literature floating around in terms of um, how at one level litigation will be controlled by the revenue looking at uh, matters if they are lying in in courts right we we, we already had something to that extent in the sense that um, um, if um, if for the taxpayer there was a matter which was lying in the supreme court the revenue had the right to kind of defer or delay the filing of the appeal uh, if they wanted to contest it They've extended that on two counts. One is that the matter can be lying now even at the high court. And the second thing is that it need not be lying only in the case of the specific taxpayer. If that same issue is, um, is lying in case of any other taxpayer also, then they would uh, defer the filing of the appeal. And, and, and that's, a, that's a welcome step. But I think you also make an important point that on one hand, you are, you are trying to bring down the number of cases. But on the, on the other hand, are you effectively trying to bring in provisions which effectively will increase uh, litigation? Um, the legislature always has the right to decide in terms of what is the philosophy and, 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 and policy that they should follow uh, in, in, in terms of um, uh, how they, how they uh, put out the regulations, right? The, 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 the thing is that in doing so, uh, are you going to ensure that the litigation reduces or increases the important point? Is doing retrospective amendments one of the ways of uh, reducing litigation? Now that's a that's a backhand way of doing it. Is that I go and you know resolve all the cases uh, which are lying by going and making a retrospective amendment? I don't know whether uh, that's that's the right way of doing it. That is also one way of reducing litigation. But in in many other cases, um, uh, there there must be an effort that each and every time you introduce a new regulation, and I'm sure uh, my co-panelists will talk about uh, it in some time, that that in itself does not result in additional litigation. Let me take one example is, and as you pointed out, is the reassessment. Uh, it is just in the previous year that we moved from a regime of four to six years and 10 years in a very limited case to only allowing reopening for three years from the end of the assessment. So four years from the end of the financial year, which is a welcome move, right? People can close their books. Uh, in, in many cases, you don't have to keep uh, matters open uh, in, in the sense that if any, if, if the revenue can come and uh, open those matters up. There was a limited um, window for the revenue to have the ability to go and re-audit a taxpayer for up to 10 years provided it had 
it was revolving around uh, undisclosed assets, income arising from assets. Now, what they have done is that that explanation, they've expanded it to talk about various other things uh, that if, uh, effectively can come in, uh, which is in connection in respect of transaction, event, or occasion. And the term transaction, event, or occasion has not been defined. So you can imagine that if you have to look at the common meanings of this term, it literally includes everything. And, 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 and what is it that the revenue is, uh, or the legislator is trying to gain by including these terms to give a wider power to the authorities now to go back 10 years, including, including uh, books of accounts. So when you, when you do all of this, and, and, and um, as even in the Indian context, as you're trying to get your um, uh, tax line certain in your financials, right? What is your tax asset? What is your tax provision? Every time you do something like this, uh, as an auditor, I would go and ask people to go back and relook in terms of what potentially can come up for the uh, prior 10 years. If for a US entity, I'll go and say, okay, now from a pin 48 perspective, go and, and, and look at in terms of how this um, uh, impacts. So when we're talking about creating certainty and reducing disputes, I don't know whether this is a step in, in terms of creating certainty and reducing disputes. So where I want to close out years and say, okay, this year has been closed out. This is a classic example of one step forward and two steps back. Now, as far as the 263 is concerned, uh, in, in, in respect of now vesting the power with the commissioner to go and question in terms of what the transfer pricing officer has concluded. Now, there, my only view is that um, it was debatable in terms of whether that could have been a power which could have been stated right at the beginning, right? Because in, in all essence, if the if uh, if if the order of an assessing officer uh, can be questioned by the commissioner if it is prejudicial to the interest of the revenue, then why not the outcome of the um, of the transfer pricing officer? Though in certain cases the transfer pricing officer's orders are blessed by the transfer pricing commissioners, and therefore that could have been one of the logics in terms of why that ought not to have been done. So. That one, I'm having a mixed feeling in terms of uh, whether uh, that should or should not have happened, but this reassessment one is a, is a, is a big one in my mind. Thanks. Um, and, you know, when we look about, when we look at certainty and of course the discussion, uh, uh, taking a cue from what Frank just said, i.e. have you, like when we talk about certainty and some of the provisions that they have introduced, have we taken two steps backwards? I would also like to, um, you know, one is your financial statements, but uh, the other aspect is also around, uh, and Kalpesh, this is basically, uh, I'm coming to you, in terms of saying, you know, this entire uh, concept of uh, one, of course, the cross-border mergers was something which was at least, you know, some provision and some relaxation and recognition, at least in the tax laws, especially when we talk about uh, overseas, I mean, cross-border. Uh, A, I don't see anything around that, but they clearly seem to have covered the insolvency uh, uh, piece. And at the same time, there's also a discretion which has been given to the tax officers or especially around the definition of the successor entity and the entire liability now being passed on to the successor entity, which to my mind, I'm not sure how well that uh, you know, goes at, at least in the concept of, uh, you know, the resolution, because at the end of the day, IBC is a resolution process. And when we're talking about resolution, of course, tax is one of the items also, which every purchaser or every acquirer or every, uh, you know, uh, IRP would want to ensure that it's all settled, uh, dusted, and, you know, tied and handed over either as a part and parcel of that, or, you know, there has to be some finality. But is that something that they have kind of, again, um, you know, uh, do you believe that the provision or the amendment that is proposed, is that something which is going to be pro-resolution, pro-reorganizations? Uh, Your thoughts on that would be uh, appreciated. Hi, thanks. Uh, so uh, I think two or three points that have emerged so far, Ashri, uh, and, and taking a cue from also what Frank said, uh, 
we need for transaction space a lot of certainty, a lot of uh, clarity in terms of what is going to come as a result of the acquisition of the business or the entity that we make. Uh, whenever we look at any entity buyout or business buyout, we need to have an ability to ascertain what value of assets and business we are acquiring. Along with that, what value of assets and lab, what value of liabilities we are taking over. If we have any level of ambiguity or uncertainty, and that that keeps probably changing with probably uh, uh, you know a change like what Frank described about that section one forty eight, where it's uh, you know, it was like a one step forward and two step back, uh, it can create a lot of uncertainty and ambiguity. Uh, it is, it is it is a welcome move on the part of the government that the rate of tax has remained more or less unchanged. Uh, but when it comes to some of the procedural aspects, like the reassessment or uh, successor related liabilities, uh, it can create some level of challenges. What has been done as far as the successor liability is concerned, where let's say a merger of two entities is, is implemented or a demerger which is implemented and liabilities are required to be taken over as a result of court order. Then those liabilities uh, otherwise were coming as a part of the, the scheme of arrangement. Uh, and in the past, the tax officers still somehow used to assess the predecessor entity. And, and in, in many cases, if the predecessor entity has amalgamated and is not available, the orders were becoming redundant. So to make it now that much more clearer, they said the, autumn, the liability will become a liability of the successor. It becomes that much more streamlined. Uh, but in mergers, you would have known that the liability of the transfer entity will ensue upon the transferee in that sense. And uh, in terms of the uh, amendment around cross-border merger, was that something a hit or a miss? Uh, that's uh, that's another one. I mean, uh, from MND tax perspective, actually, the, the budget has... Uh, some policy announcements and some some other statements where, for example, the uh, the finance minister spoke about the capex to be increased by a significant amount uh, over the last year's budget by about one third. Wake up! Uh, she's also spoken about and recognized the private equity funds and venture capital funds industry because they have poured in like sixty billion dollars in the last one year, and she recognizes the, uh, the challenges that they've faced. And, and there is a need to simplify the, the ease of investing for private equity funds and venture capital funds. So there have been those statements and those, those intents which are clearly coming out. Uh, she has also, to some extent, let's say, reduced the rate of long-term capital gain by lowering the surcharge for any long-term capital asset related gain that is, ar that is arising. Uh, however, if you look at the, um, the specific asks that the industry had, there were some asks on, for example, introducing a parity in the rate of tax. Uh, individuals in India or Indians, Indian residents will pay a 20% long-term capital gain, whereas non-Indians will pay a 10% capital gain tax. Uh, there was a parity, there was a ask that uh, if cross-border merger takes place between two non-Indian companies as a result of which some indirect transfer takes place, so there should be a tax neutrality that should be prescribed, but that has not come through. If an Indian entity was to amalgamate with a non-Indian entity, uh, the, the tax neutrality is not prescribed, while it is prescribed for a non-Indian entity merging in an Indian entity. So there are some aspects which the industry had asked from an entity tax perspective. None of those asks have actually been addressed by the finance ministers. To, to that extent, yes, there are, there are those uh, misses and we need to wait for the next ones and see if, if those come through. Thank you. Thanks. Um, moving on to, you know, clearly growth oriented budget, infrastructure being again uh, right at the core um, and very close to the heart of the prime minister as well as the finance minister. Shravan Kumar, you must be a very happy man. Uh, uh, is that, yeah, and uh, you know, clearly, um, I would expect that uh, you will be the, at least with a lot of enthusiasm, say that, okay, yes, we have arrived and at least some of the changes that you would have wanted has been accepted and probably they've really looked at it more from a, as a, you know, more uh, progressively 
rather than taking steps which kind of make it a little difficult for the infrastructure companies to actually operate at the ground level. So your thoughts around that? Yeah, uh, at the outset, I would like to say, I think it's a mixed feeling, not entirely of uh, complete elation. But I think we must learn to also give credit to what good things uh, government is doing. So I think the uh, uh, restricting the surcharge on the you know AOPs uh, is an extremely important uh, change that I have uh, brought about. Uh, of course, this has been a long-standing uh, demand. I remember making representations over the period of time. This is very important because all the Mega infrastructure projects, typically you find uh, there are, you know, groups of two, three people come together and execute. I can, uh, one of the one of the first uh, projects that we uh, did uh, was, of course, this Delhi Metro, where uh, five companies came together and uh, did. Uh, I'm talking about 20 years ago when Delhi Metro started. Uh, I think these kind of large uh, projects, if you want to encourage this AOP structure, and there's no alternative to encouraging them, I think, uh, I think we need to be thankful to the government for listening to this, okay? Uh, now, what are the misses as far as infrastructure industry is concerned? Uh, actually, a couple of them are not in the tax domain, so I will not elaborate. I will just mention them and leave it. I think many uh, difficulties, challenges that uh, infrastructure faces today um, are uh, in the realm of you know policy regime and not uh, really the tax regime. Um, uh, straightening out the PPP structure, the contract formats, sharing of the risks fairly between the government and the private sector entity that will execute the project. I think there is still some distance to travel. Unless the PPP structure is seen to be a very, uh, what I would say, uh, unbiased and uh, fair thing, providing for a quick redressal of uh, the, the commercial aspects of the job, I think that will go a long way, but that's not in the tax regime, as I said. Uh, there's one more point I just want to mention, uh, but of course I must uh, say that it doesn't uh, fall in the direct taxes category. Um, uh, it, it's about the GST uh, tax. Um, I think I'll take some liberty and spend two, three minutes on, although it is not a direct tax uh, thing, because it's an extremely important uh, uh, point. Uh, for some time, the industry has been asking the government to correct inverted duty structure. I'm sure infra is not the only sector where in, inverted duty structure exists. Uh, but I think in this uh, sector, the, the inversion is of a very high degree, especially when some of the projects that you do for government, like irrigation projects and all that, where the GST rate can be all the way, uh, you know, go down to 5%. And uh, you pay on uh, steel, cement, and all that. You pay 18%, 24% kind of, 28% kind of taxes. There's a lot of accumulation of input tax credit, which I'm not able to use to pay my output uh, uh, tax liability. The formula for refunding the accumulated credit uh, ignores the tax paid on the services. Uh, it refunds me only GST paid on the goods. So it works really against the taxpayer and for no reason. Uh, to be fair, the government acknowledged that this is an issue. Way back into the fiscal policy strategy document was tabled. In, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm getting a message that my connection is a bit unstable. I I hope I'm being audible. Uh, you're able to hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, yeah, great. Okay, so to be fair, the government acknowledged it as a problem, uh, not refunding uh, taxes on services, uh, uh, which are getting accumulated and the taxpayer is not able to use. They acknowledged the issue uh, in one of the budget documents in 2019, uh, but the action is not forthcoming to correct the inverted duty uh, structure. I think uh, that's a really big miss. Generally, it is understood that GST, indirect taxes uh, are not part of the budget document as they used to be. You know, uh, GST council and all that, we have a 
um, uh, structure and protocol defined there. But uh, this time I found that there are some amendments relating to CGST coming in. So I'm mentioning this point. There is also one more uh, amendment, which is, uh, which is a far reaching uh, consequence. And I don't think, and I don't think they should have done it. Let me tell you what is it. Uh, to, to pay your output tax liability, you use input credits, which you are accumulating. Now they have amended a particular section, which enables them to prescribe the maximum amount of input tax credit you can use to pay output tax liability in a given month. For example, you have to pay 100, 100 rupees. They can say that 80 has to come from input tax credit. Only 80 can come. Remaining 20 you have to shell out cash. That could be the situation. So I think, uh, according to me, this is something which uh, uh, definitely not going to help business. It is going to further lock up the working capital. So, so I thought I'll just mention these uh, uh, points. That's the story in the infra sector. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so, you know, clearly when it comes to doling out refunds, not necessarily doling out, but releasing refunds for that matter, uh, especially the point around the blocking of working capital, wherein the offset of the input credit, uh, the point that you made, uh, you know, clearly they also have to have some sources of revenue, right? And which is what we've seen in this budget is the entire taxability of the virtual digital asset. And uh, why have they taken two steps ahead and said that, okay, let's go ahead and produce a tax regime for uh, taxing the, uh, the virtual digital asset. They also seem to have taken a step backwards around the 14A deduction, uh, which again has been one huge pain point. With that, I will, um, Keur, I move on to you and I would request 14A. What does it mean for um, players in the financial services or for that matter, players across, especially corporate India, and yeah. uh, thereafter, your perspective on this entire taxability of the virtual digital asset. So on 14 year Rajshri, as you know, there were conflicting decisions uh, of the various courts, but the consistent view it seemed to be emerging was that in a year in which you don't earn any tax free income, uh, there should be no disallowance under 14 year. Now, I mean, again, going back to Frank's point that therefore we have now suddenly provided clarity by just amending the section <laughs> and therefore to that extent reducing litigation. But the challenge which I face here is that, you know, going back to 2012, uh, when we had made retrospective amendments after that government after government has said that we will never make retrospective amendments. The way 14A amendment is worded is to say that this is what the intent of the government or the legislature, le legislature was always that you should not get a deduction in a year, uh, you deduction for uh, expenditure, which you could have possibly incurred uh, in a particular year when there is no uh, income. So this is a, in my view, I mean, not the right thing to do because there was jurisprudence around it. The right thing would have been that let the courts decide how the section should have been worded. And if we want to change it and bring in a clarification, the ideal thing would have been not to say that this was the intent of the law, but to say that going forward, this is how the law will get interpreted. Uh, I agree that the parliament has the right to decide how a particular item should be taxed. And that is a right which constitution has given to it. But making these retrospective amendments just again creates further amount of uncertainty in the minds, especially when you are looking at attracting foreign investment that, you know, people will suddenly say that, you know, you promised on the floor of the house that you're not going to make retrospective amendments. Are you going back on your word? So it's a little sensitive part. Uh, and I think that there, you know, in my view, the government needs to just come out a little bit more clearly on what they want to do with retrospective amendments because this is not the only one there there is on education says and we can talk about it later or on uh, even on the part on reassessment which frank spoke about they've said that you know or some of these amendments are deemed to have been introduced last year when we made the change in the law is is the part which is you know hurting me in terms of our reputation as a government which is forward looking uh, so that is one part on the virtual digital assets as again, Frank alluded to earlier. I mean, they've 
one thing they've done which is good thing is that they've at least acknowledged that there is a tax issue there and put in a element to say that you know virtual digital assets would be taxed at 30% uh the open issues there are uh, one that will you be able to set off uh within virtual digital assets if you made loss in the same year and income in the same year will you pay tax on the net basis because what they are saying now is that no loss will be allowed to be set off uh with respect to clearly with respect to intra intra head set off so business income cannot be set off against uh loss again on uh, virtual digital assets and i think that part is clear uh they are also saying that the cost of uh the cost of acquisition will be something which will be allowed as a deduction that part is clear but the part where say for example i have sold me a done two virtual digital asset transactions in a year one is a gain one is a loss can i pay tax on a net income basis seems to be not happily worded so i think we we'll hope that some clarification will come out around that uh the other part is the whole definition of virtual digital assets again very very wide uh they've they've retained the power to come out with guidance around how this taxation would work so i'm hoping that they will be restricting this virtual digital assets only to uh things like a cryptocurrency or a nft which seems to be the intent here and not anything which is you know the way the way the section is worded anything which is a number or a token which represents value and where it is exchange so you know what could that mean could it mean uh, credit card points could it mean what and hopefully and again clearly this is not the intent the intent seems to be to cover only uh your cryptocurrencies and nfts but we are just hoping that when they come out with clarifications they will do something around this uh the third part which i think is also going to be the most challenging part is this whole thing around 1% withholding tax which is required to be done on all uh, virtual digital asset related payments now they also go on to say that if there is an exchange in kind in the sense that there's a nft being sold for say for example a crypto uh then the person who is supposed to make the payment has to ensure that the person who is receiving the income discharges the tax liability it's going to be very very difficult to implement some of these things uh in terms of what kind of comfort would the uh person paying the money need uh is it okay that if i just take a declaration uh that you know the person that other person will file a return of income is that good enough do i ask him for proof of having filed the return of income do i ask him for proof of having paid the tax i don't know where the where will one draw the line again i'm hoping that once the clarifications come out uh they will give some certainty to the person who supposed to withhold tax in terms of where he needs to stop uh because otherwise this could become significantly chaotic in terms of implementation so that is my two bits around 14a and virtual digital assets thanks um you know clearly around uh, uh, the virtual digital asset as well as around uh, uh, 14a um again you know steps have been like especially around the virtual digital asset right because they retain the power to notify what a virtual digital asset will be so that to my mind is like one huge um, it's one axe which is hanging on everybody's uh, around everybody's uh, on everybody's head which you don't know when is going to chop your uh, neck off um but having said that uh, redo again uh, in terms of there was a lot of expectation around uh, you know of course startups have received a lot of uh, again there's been an extension and clearly this government recognizes that uh, startups are here to stay and that is the way forward uh but they still seem to be struggling around this entire esop taxation so is that something which you've kind of dealt with is that something that you have uh, you know uh, kind of do you believe coming in from the services industry is that something that requires attention and uh, your thoughts around that from a tax perspective and even from an employee uh, standpoint you're on mute reenu reenu you're on mute sorry so uh from an employee perspective we don't have esop so i can't comment on it but uh from a tax perspective yes i think a lot of clarity is required because again like in various other uh, uh issues there are a lot of uh, different judgments on the taxation of esop so i think uh, you know while you have court uh, cases or litigation on it i think somewhere the clarity is lacking 
and uh, that is much needed. Thanks. Thanks for that. So this again uh, goes back to if I have a jurisdictional high court, so maybe I don't know how we will probably work around this, but that's something which uh, should be at least uh, considered in, to my mind, because yeah, it doesn't because, impact your uh, employees yeah, at least, right? Yeah, because you have, uh, you have jurisprudence, you have a high court, and then they do something retrospectively. So where does the taxpayer or the SSC stand actually? Sure. Yeah, thanks. Frank, uh, you know, uh, clearly when we talk about ESOPs and employees, you know, moving on to this entire um, uh, discussion around perquisites and the TDS on perquisites, uh, how would, what is your take on that? You know, especially that provision, is that something which is pro-corporate India? Is it making people uh, life simple or is it just adding to their troubles and es essentially making uh, compliance is far more expensive and thereby cost of doing business in India? So your thoughts around that? So um, the fact that uh, we have always had a strong regime of collecting taxes through TDS on every possible income that anybody earns. Okay, we have the one of, I think, uh, one of the few countries which collects taxes in this manner to the extent that we do. Uh, it, is, it is not surprising that this has come in. Okay, what, what, what becomes more difficult because of the specific issue out here uh, is that what is a situation where perquisite arises? So just let me just take a step back in terms of what the, what is the proposal uh, in the budget is um, in respect of any person who in the course of undertaking business or profession earns any per perquisite, uh, which, is, which is then taxable. Uh, the person who's providing such a perquisite is required to withhold tax at the rate of 10%. Um, assuming that uh, the total value of such perquisite uh, is, is going to exceed 20,000 uh, rupees in a year. Um, now, now the point is that um, it has always been a debate. It has always been a debate in terms of what is meant by perquisite. So we have all of that uh, in, in respect of individual taxation. And, and, and now the domain of that also falls into all, all, all that we do. So if I'm a consultant uh, to a company, and the company uh, picks up the tab uh, for my stay and travel in order to render services to them, is that a perquisite which has been offered to me? Is, is a question. Now, everyone and, and, and everyone who is entering, every uh, corporate or anyone else who is entering into those kind of transactions will have to sit and look at in, 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 in respect of, you know, does that, does that in any manner create a benefit or a perquisite? The other aspect, here also is, and which is similar to what is there um, in, the, in, in the digital assets, is that uh, even if the benefit is in kind, you please go find a way of depositing the 10% tax, which will mean that there will be a gross up element which will come in because if, if something is in kind, I still have to uh, meet uh, the liability, assuming that I have no other payment uh, which is being made uh, to the service provider. Uh, then I have to find way of grossing it up and making the payment. What will corporates do in most of the cases is that they will effectively, because they do not, of course, it increases the compliance burden. But if there's a gray area in terms of whether that arrangement results in a perquisite or not, they will say we will withhold taxes either by grossing up or by reducing it from the other fees or otherwise which is payable, consideration which is payable to the uh, service provider. Now, think about the service provider. He has to now decide uh, in terms of whether, given the position that the corporate has taken, that is he going to treat this as income? If he's not going to treat it as income, how is he going to explain in terms of claiming a refund for the taxes which have been withheld under this pro new provision of 194R? So again, it, the, the entire compliance part of it is something which, which, which makes it more onerous. So at a point of time, uh, when we talk about overall simplification and rationalization, in looking at it from that perspective, uh, I, can, I can imagine this is one of the other ways of uh, where the uh, regulator is, 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 is trying to kind of uh, ensure compliances uh, in, in, in respect of proper tax payment by putting the burden on the, on the, on the supply chain to, to, to do all the work for them. So 
it is going to increase uh, compliance as one part of it but there's a there's going to be a lot of this which is going to be debatable in terms of which kind of arrangements give rise to perquisite so uh, yeah it's, uh, it's 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 not an easy one this one is not an easy one so you know clearly in terms of when i mean you're absolutely right because i e if uh, tomorrow if you expect small businesses right because there's no threshold threshold has been given but it's like too marginal right so on one hand we say that yes we want uh, businesses to focus on business and not spend too much of time on compliance and litigation but it, this definitely seems to be again a step not in the right direction um, and I'm surprised because they do get all the information on the under the AIS. They have various mechanisms wherein they can collect the information. So why this TDS? I don't know. Maybe it's uh, as you rightly said, TDS is one of the you know uh, obviously has been always the easiest way to ensure that uh, revenue is collected at source. The other issue also, Rashi, is that classification issue, right? What is specific and what is more general? If I am someone whose taxes are being withheld under 194C. And there is a benefit or a perquisite which I which I earn on account of rendering uh, or undertaking some work because of which 194C has been applied. Then why is my primary payment subject to two percent, and this perquisite which arises subject to ten percent? It does not make sense. So that's that's the other element which also come into play, and I'm sure that that will be the other uh, kind of. Uh, uh, issue that will arise in terms of the specific versus general and which will override the other in context of the contract under which the payments are being made. What is the contract for? Is it a contract and the payment which is getting covered by 194C or 194J, which also has a provision for a tax rate which is lower than 10%? As against then coming and looking at this 10% tax and saying that, no, I'm still going to apply this. So that will be the other aspect which will have to be considered. You know, clearly when, uh, so operating in a domestic area, you know, clearly is going to put all of this, uh, the, all these aspects are something which corporates will have to take care of. So therefore, you know, should we just relocate to IFSC? Okay, you, you should be one happy man who basically, uh, uh, because IFSC is the only um, jurisdiction which seems to have uh, found favor in this budget. So your take on that. Yeah, so I think that is that is true, Rajri. I think uh, this is one sector which the government has been always uh, in the last few years uh, being topmost in their priority list. I think uh, on this side, I think the work has been commendable. Uh, every every nuance in terms of ensuring clarity has been introduced and you know continues to be introduced. So I think full marks uh, when it is due. Uh, this gift city piece. Uh, very, very clear, clear that we need to create a financial services hub in India and uh, we are all working towards that. So in terms of the changes which got announced uh, this time, uh, four changes. Uh, the large one is obviously around uh, the offshore derivative instruments, uh, which is essentially uh, an instrument which gives you a uh, notional exposure on Indian security. So some of these instruments, offshore derivative instruments, or P-notes as they are commonly called at times, uh, are issued by many of these banks uh, to offshore investors who don't want to invest into India through the FPI license. And what they are now saying is that uh, if you have a OBU, which is an offshore banking unit in GIFT, and that OBU is issuing uh, some of these uh, offshore derivative instruments to non-residents, uh, then the income of the non-resident from that instrument will not be subject to any taxes. Uh, fairly interesting move. Uh, I mean, one way to look at it is that this is more clarificated because anyway, this was a non-resident who was sub subscribing to ODIs and uh, there was some form of an exemption available earlier as well. But I think good move uh, will provide clarity. Uh, there are certain legal aspects to this in terms of what instruments can you issue an ODI against in India currently, uh, given that you are based out of an OBU and not uh, based in Hong Kong or Singapore, where you would be governed by regulations uh, operating there. Uh, so that part aside, I think from a tax perspective, there is now clarity in terms of how non-residents buying uh, ODIs will be taxed. Uh, the other amendment, again, uh, is a good one, is around uh, 56.27a, which basically provides, in simplistic term, was a section where if you subscribe to shares at a premium, 
and uh, the premium was higher than fair market value, then you would, the company had to pay a tax on the differential. There was a carve out there uh, to cover non-residents and uh, venture capitalists. Now, if you were a fund based out of gift, which was a category one or a category two fund, which is essentially the private equity tax, uh, then to that extent, again, the, there was a question mark that whether you would get that exemption because, you know, under FEMA, you're not resident, but under Income Tax Act, you're still a resident. Uh, so that part, again, has got clarified and they've said that uh, the 5627A exemption will, uh, the carve out under 5627B, uh, sorry, uh, will be even available to uh, 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 to AIFs uh, based in GIF. Uh, they want to create a global leasing platform also out of GIF. Uh, so there were certain amendments which were made with respect to aircraft leasing. Uh, in the context of uh, royalties or interest paid by entities in gift to non-residents uh, on having leased aircrafts uh, from them. Uh, similar exemptions have been extended to shipping uh, ships and also transfer of ships and aircrafts, therefore, uh, is not subject to tax. So for large income tax amendments, they made some other amendments also in terms of uh, attracting green bonds and creating an environment around that. Uh, and also around uh, uh, universities to be set up in GIF. So some of those were the other uh, amendments, but very forward looking as far as GIFT is concerned. Sure, thanks. Including, I think the, she did announce the International Arbitration Center also, right? Yes. Which, yes, uh, yes. which again, like uh, seems that, okay, uh, those are opening up to councils and people, of course, with uh, expertise Correct. who can station themselves in the uh, in, in, uh, GIF in city. Yeah. So yeah, uh, you know, clearly from a Gibsity perspective and IFSC, of course, uh, quite forward looking. Um, but at the same time, uh, you know, gift, um, uh, does that mean that they, this will give rise to a lot of uh, m &A activity as well, uh, Kalpesh, given the fact that uh, you can have an international arbitration centers out there, you will have, of course, with the bad bank uh, being set up and, uh, NPAs and the determination to resolve some of these um, issues. Do you foresee a lot of m &A activity and what do you think could be one or two stumbling blocks out there to ensure a seamless uh, implementation of the same? I'm talking overall. So, you know, it's not just a specific provision. I'm just saying the fact that we know that there are distressed assets, there have been steps uh, and policy announcements that have been uh, made. But of course, there are some still in the pipeline and this entire cross-border insolvency. Of course, there's a lot to be done on the legal side, especially bilateral trade uh, agreements that we need to have. And we all know some of the cases that uh, do get referred when these kind of discussions uh, take place. Question is, if we were to look at from an implementation standpoint, do you believe that from an M&A standpoint and from a private equity investor standpoint, is this something, uh, you know, a good thing and what are some of the stumbling blocks that you foresee? Yeah, so uh, Rashtra, the, the, you know, uh, the economy is at the at the uh, juncture where, and we have seen a very, very buoyant and very active year from m and perspective last year. Uh, we believe that if, if the economy continues to grow the way it is growing and the finance minister has provided it, you know, right, right amount of uh, boost, it could have been a populous budget, uh, given that there are five states going for election. But the, the finance minister has taken a bold call in that sense to focus on the growth agenda of the country. Uh, decided basically to, you know, put more money for uh, capex, which will take whatever time it will take to generate the employment and to generate the uh, consumption cycle. But she's 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 clearly focusing in the right direction. Uh, there are other amendments as, as have been proposed, uh, as Kev just articulated from a, a gift perspective, international arbitration, trying to foster the financial service sector industry, providing support where it is needed. For example, MSME needed a little bit more support or hospitality sector needed more support. So the, uh, the guarantee scheme has been uh, extended to them. Uh, there has been an additional outlay which is proposed even for the uh, Prime Minister's Avas Yudna, uh, through which they are expected to provide 80 lakh homes. Uh, 
clearly therefore there is a lot more which is expected from the industry on the capex side therefore there should be a lot more construction lot more cement consumption lot more steel consumption so the basic industries should have a lot more to uh, cheer about and then to to uh, just to look at uh, the subsequent cycle uh, therefore there is you know stress uh, which is which is provided to the financial service sector as well uh, bad uh, loan loan bank uh, a significant amount of loans getting trans transitioned there. Uh, there has been therefore uh, impetus provided. Expectation therefore is that the MND will continue and will 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 see a lot of uh, capital coming in with the Indian economy, one of the largest growing, expected to grow at close to about nine percent on, on a go forward basis. Uh, the chances are that we will have a good activity there. Uh, stumbling blocks, I think, two or three things that that stand out to my mind uh, the first thing which is you know again going back to the point that frank alluded certainty uh, in terms of how and, and what will come and hit you at what point in time uh, would i have retrospective amendments trying to recover something which i didn't budget for would i have reopening of audits after a certain reasonable period of time because of the way in which the laws are worded would i have uh, amendments in the law which will then be clarificatory in nature whenever they get introduced and therefore will, will create complications. So that's one stumbling block that I see uh, in that activity. The, the second is there are certain asks that the industry has been having in terms of you know uh, directly overseas listing for example. There are certain sunrise sectors which even, even though the Indian economy, Indian IPO market is so much buoyed but they will not get appropriate valuation. If they were provided an ability to list directly in the offshore market, either directly or through SPACs, and there was some provision in the tax laws to facilitate that, that would have benefited those industries that much more and more capital would have come into Indian economy. Uh, from whatever other signals, it seems that the government borrowing will increase. If the government borrowing increases, the interest rates will get hardened further. The borrowing cost will go up. Uh, so there, there has to be some uh, moment, some uh, further thought around that, and there has to be some arresting of the rising of interest while arresting the inflation at the same time. Uh, on a smaller point, uh, on, on a bonus stripping provision which, which got introduced, now most companies which go for IPO will have some uh, some fundraising just before the IPO to uh, to to uh, somewhat get a price benchmark. And then we'll also have a bonus issuance to make sure that the price per share is that much more affordable for retail investors. Will bonus by bonus before the IPO hit some of those investors and will that create some challenges? So I, I think there are some bigger points and some smaller points. Overall basis, I still think the environment is really right for the MA activity to, uh, to, to uh, grow further and, and for all of us to be kept busy. There could have been some things that uh, that could have been done, and therefore, a deal mange more is always the card. Taking a cue from the bonus stripping uh, point that you raised, okay, their intent is very clear, so they've covered it. In fact, they've gone and widened the definition to include even REITs and invits. Uh, so obviously, you know, uh, you know, the, the infra. Uh, on one hand, we say you know, invits is a good investment. They then come and say that, okay, sorry, guys. Uh, but if you have um, uh, dividend stripping and bonus stripping around there, that's also something which is covered. So, can you your take on this entire dividend stripping uh, uh, issue and uh, the challenges faced by investors? Yeah, so actually, I think Kalpesh covered a few points there. I think uh, we had dividend stripping anyways in the uh, in the section. Uh, now we have introduced uh, this whole provision around bonus stripping where. Uh, if you sell shares uh, post bonus, which we've acquired uh, pre bonus, and obviously there will be a loss because the price of the shares will go down uh, post bonus. Uh, we are being told that uh, the loss will not be allowed as a reduction or will not be allowed as a loss at all. Uh, but what we could do is that that could be added to the cost of the shares which are unsold. So to that extent, there is some level of protection which is there. Uh, Similarly, uh, for REITs and invits also, the same provisions are being introduced. Also, dividend stripping provisions are being introduced for REITs and invits. Uh, as you rightly said, this was there. Uh, I think 
there was some level of and Kalpesh just to counter what we are seeing there was some level of uh, you know activity which was happening as as we used to hear that people used to do this to reduce their capital gain exposure especially uh, on thinly traded stocks by doing this whole bonus uh, uh, pre bonus post bonus uh, acquisition of shares and building up losses so i think this was a loophole which was waiting to be plugged and uh, i guess they have plugged it uh, it will it impact uh, some genuine guys yes it will uh, but i don't know whether i mean my only take here is that we've got larger issues like how will you do withhold tax on uh, virtual digital asset uh, on a stock exchange <laughs> and how will you implement that something the exchange yeah. consider yeah yeah but it's a tough one actually in terms of uh, you know this bonus tipping as well but i guess it, this one was waiting to happen is the way i look at it that's a question of time and of yeah. course we missed the bus on the bond uh, market right because that was something which seemed to be a dampener at least all the global investors that's the uh, one consistent um, uh, feedback that at least i've been getting over the past i would say two years but uh, this year of course they expected uh, some uh, steps to be taken but uh, nothing's been done on that front so apparently um, i'm told that there is some committee which is being set up uh, yeah. i think i don't i've lost count of the number of committees but at least one more committee is got set up uh, and also to look at some tax aspects so hopefully there will be some light at the end of the tunnel yeah hopefully fingers crossed yeah. um uh, with that i would like to again then you know move on to the, the one sector which seems to have uh, uh, infra i come back to infra which is again core uh, for growth and from an economic development standpoint as well um shantma today if we were to look at uh, uh, you know the, the the number of companies and the number of projects and especially the fact that you do have presence in different uh, jurisdictions in different countries right unilateral uh, changes being uh, carried on in our tax laws um, how does that kind of weigh in when uh, we need to operate or when we actually are looking at um, uh, you know cross border uh, working so let me give you an example what i mean is let's assume you have a project going on in say qatar or for that matter uh, uae or uh, for that matter australia and if we uh, you know kind of introduce changes which kind of uh, seem to be benefiting uh, only from an indian tax collection standpoint where does that leave you uh, especially from a foreign tax credit a is that something which you get 100% is that something which is kind of uh, you know it's a cash loss or is that something you know it's a complete write off i mean cash loss and a write off so your um, you know uh, thoughts around this entire cross border operations and of course foreign tax credits yeah um, <clears throat> as far as my experience goes uh, rashri uh, the foreign tax credit issues in the infrastructure have been uh, sector have been fairly simple in the sense that it's it's It translates into what uh, country? What is the tax rate uh, here? So there have been situations where, uh, because of uh, the tax rates uh, being higher uh, in the uh, overseas jurisdiction, there have been leakages of uh, foreign tax credit, which uh, we have to bear it as a cost. Uh, of course, we have we have tried to. uh claim it under uh, the residual section but i don't think that will get finally uh, allowed so i think uh, all the foreign tax issues as far as this sector is concerned they are not uh, really challenges other than this sorry yeah sure and uh, of course uh, i i mean i'm not sure renu do you agree do you have a different point of view at least from a services sector standpoint and to top it our corporate tax return okay which is like when we talk about digital economy fintech the fact that our return forms will not allow you to do what you believe is the right position under law i think that's a different battle which uh, you know needs to be uh, uh, kind of picked up discussed uh, debated uh, because today if i go to file in uh, fill in a return of income 
even if you have a position that you've been taking and which is something which is permissible, the form may not allow you to you know, uh, carry out those changes. And I think that's um, something which probably all of us are dealing with right now. But uh, Renu, your thoughts around the services sector uh, and this entire issue of foreign tax credits, is that something which is a given or? Uh, no, I think, uh, so I quite agree with uh, Shankar. I think more or less uh, um, the FTC is given in the sense so far, uh, I think, as long as you fulfill the requirements of you know completing the litigation, making sure that you have paid the tax in the other jurisdiction, I think you can claim the FTC. I think the other thing is it has to be as per the treaty and uh, only the federal taxes would be allowed and obviously the state and any other tax that that overseas jurisdiction could levy on you, which may not be a federal in nature, uh, will not be disallowed. So there are some issues where certain jurisdictions are levying some additional tax as say for example, an offshore royalty. It's not actually a royalty, but they're levying it. Now that doesn't come under the double taxation treaty. So in those cases, we are denied the FTC. But by and large, I quite agree. I think that is done. But the issue, like you rightly said, the form is not uh, ready for something like that. I think that's uh, that's one challenge that we are facing today. In I mean, most of us will be facing today. Um, but the point, the point, sorry, right? The point there is it becomes very discretionary at the hands of the assessing officer, which should not be the case. Absolutely. Sure. Sure. And uh, with that, especially now, given uh, the fact that you're moving more and more towards the faceless assessment, uh, Frank, your thoughts around uh, in terms of the changes that they've introduced under this entire faceless assessment regime, is that something which is, you know, seems to be a welcome move, but uh, uh, is that something which is going to achieve the objective that uh, every corporate would be looking for, i.e., accept our return, because this is at the end of the day, more governance, less regulation, less government interference. So please go and act, I mean, please go with the fact that what we are presenting, especially, and I'm not saying all, you really can't, uh, you know, paint everybody with the same brush, but especially corporates who are also assessed under GST, who file, you've got uh, listed companies, these corporates, do you still need to go through every return form, every scrutiny assessment, and this entire concept of faceless assessment? What's your take on that? Those are two different aspects. One is that uh, whether every corporate needs to be audited every year. So that's one issue. And how we audit it is whether faceless or otherwise. That's that's the second one. Uh, there is there is some uh, principles that uh, are have been adopted in in terms of picking up cases for audit, right? So so that that still remains and that doesn't change because it's faceless or otherwise. The large taxpayer unit, which is supposed to consolidate all the uh, audits in one place didn't really take off and operate in the manner that it, have, it had to operate. And therefore that has not been a tremendous success. Uh, but I don't think that um, taxpayers overall, uh, at least uh, there was a point of time where everyone used to get literally picked up every year for an audit. And, and I can see that there's a downward trend as far as that is concerned. Unless, of course, there is something which uh, has been uh, contested to a significant degree in one year, and then to see it through, then you would pick up that case for the subsequent years also. So, so on that count, I think um, uh, I don't believe that everyone gets audited each and every year, including the large corporations. Uh, if if they are getting picked up for audit, would be with a reason in terms of the fact that there is something which has come up in their system, which requires that, that audit to take place. Coming to faceless, um, I think it is going to be, it is going, it's going to continue to be in an experiment, experiment stage for some period of time. This is something I don't, I have not seen being employed anywhere else in the world in terms of the whole process that internally it goes through. So one is the interface uh, with the taxpayer and other is the interface which happens internally within the system. The amendments which have come out now are therefore in two parts, how the interface within the different units of the faceless assessment, how they will kind of uh, work with each other. And the second is in respect of the interface with the taxpayer. So one of the easier things that they've done is that if you upload something on the portal, then that would be uh, seen to have been digitally verified and therefore that simplifies the whole process in terms of how submissions uh, had to be filed. Uh, there have been two, three um, issues which have come up. 
and 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 the courts have also kind of um, uh, pitched in on this one given the risks that have gone in on this matter one is the whole concept of natural justice that why is it going to be discretionary for someone from the department to decide whether i need to be heard or not in terms of an actual hearing whether the hearing takes place in video or otherwise is a different matter and to that extent um, what they have the the change that they are proposing is that that is not discretionary anymore and if the taxpayer were to seek to uh, have to be uh, given an opportunity to be heard then that opportunity will be given so that's that's one change which has been brought about so first so it's not discretionary and the and the officer concerned does not have to take anyone's approval to be able to afford that opportunity to the uh, taxpayer the other bit was that in a situation where matters can be complex right in a situation where matters can be complex and which you then realize not at the time of picking up the case for audit but as the process uh, uh, unfolds is now there is an ability for the uh, for the system to be able to take that case out from faceless assessment and send it and send it to the chief commissioner and then to the assessing officer who can then take it forward because to some extent there is a recognition of the fact that in quite a few cases uh, given the complexity i think the faceless um, uh, scheme will not be able to adequately address um, the nuances and therefore what is it that the one the taxpayer wants to explain second is what is that the tax officer understands and therefore now they have enshrined the fact that you know the case can be lifted out from the face assessment scheme and sent to the to a, to a field officer uh, who will then take it forward so from that perspective i think it's a welcome move um again uh, as as i'm saying this is going to be an experiment for the next 2 3 years it is going to take some time in terms of the finessing that has to happen for it to be able to work uh, well and and this will not be the only change that will happen and we will see changes coming in uh, for some more time now no wonder they have gone ahead and extended the date by which they were supposed to issue the administrative orders in terms of uh, uh, having the transfer pricing cases running through um, the faceless schemes the whole of the tribunal so all of that uh, is 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 therefore being deferred because they also recognize they need to get this going far better than what is happening right now sure thanks so uh, and so your take on this uh, budget uh, frank from a corporate uh, india and from a tax professional standpoint how would you rate this budget so i have always felt that um, a budget that introduces the least changes is a good budget right because if every year you're going to have some 200 amendments it defeats the purpose of law right so sure. so that part uh, i think to that extent um, it is it is something that i would give a thumbs up to so that's that's one part of it um and and directional i think di being something directional is important so if you are reducing the tax rates over a period of time and you move in that direction it helps we have kept this tax rate steady we have reduced uh, uh, proposing to reduce the surcharge in certain cases that's a welcome new now why you have to uh, give up the 15% beneficial rate in terms of dividends that were being brought in by indian companies from uh, shareholding that they had in foreign entities uh, beats the logic but uh, for whatever it is worth uh, this uh, now convinces um, uh, corporates in india to keep the money overseas and not bring it to india is a different matter but directionally if you move so for example startup if it is working well we are finding that the ecosystem for startup is is really booming let us extend the period uh, which is uh, for start of business as as far as uh, uh, new manufacturing concerned so from a directional perspective when i see it i i find that it is in the right direction i find that the number of uh, changes which have been proposed are few which is good so that that shows stability okay is now they are going to rock the boat each and every time um yeah there have been a few things which which uh, vex the mind and and and, and clearly uh, you know uh, to to think about how some of those things will be implemented uh, becomes an issue but i i find that 
that is something that we'll always have, right? That is something that we'll always have. The only one thing that I would request, and I don't know whether uh, she will uh, amend it in any fashion when the bill uh, finally passes, is that anything which is retrospective, and I think we, the government needs to be a little large-hearted on these things, independent of what the intention may have been, saying that, okay, they recognize this is how the courts are interpreting. Maybe we were not very clear in terms of how we expressed it when you originally wrote the law, but this is how we want to do it from a go-forward basis. If that can be done, then, 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 then that'll be something that will, that will uh, uh, feel good. At the end of it, it'll be a feel good thing. Thanks. Kiyo, do you agree with that? What's your view? Yeah, I mean, Frank has said all the right things and the nice things. Uh, <laughs> 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 I get a little concerned about this whole retrospectivity. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, things like education says, now, you know, everyone I speak to tells me that, you know, that was always the intent, right? You know, why would you, you know, you introduce education says because you didn't want to give the money to the states, you want to give the money to yourself, you introduce a section, now suddenly people are claiming a reduction. I mean, that can never be the intention. And I'm also not saying that that could have been the intention of the government, right? But what is the sense of introducing something and then saying that was, you know, I've lost the battle, so now I'm going to change it retrospectively from 2005. It's you know, from an international investor perspective, look at how it reads. In 2022, you are changing a section which is introspective from 2005. It's not a big amount. And my only point here is that if the numbers, and the numbers can't be that large. If the numbers are not that large, as Frank said, you know, somebody needs to be large-hearted and send the right message to say that we will look at this prospectively. I don't want the money for the past, but when you look at it, guys, in the forward, in the future, this is how I want to interpret it. Now, people have gone to all the way up to the high court on uh, 14A, but we are still coming back with saying this was my intent. Now, if yours, this was your intent, now court should have reordered it. Court is reading it differently. Bad luck. Just walk ahead in life. But I think that part is the thing which is, which is, which is not going well from my perspective. Otherwise, I think, yeah, I agree. Uh, less tinkering is good. Uh, you know, uh, this whole crypto thing puts to rest controversy around how it will be taxed and leaves the, you know, at least that provides a framework in terms of how people will tax cryptocurrency. Otherwise, there was just chaos and people did not know how the tax office would react to some of these things. So to that extent, it's good. Uh, and uh, also from the perspective of uh, the whole uh, thing around uh, gift city, not to forget, I think that clearly is a move in the right direction. I think they will continue to promote Gift City. So I think that is, again, another positive move. Thanks. Renu, your take, Corporate India. Yeah, so I think I agree with both uh, Kayur and Frank. I think it's been a refreshing budget, growth-oriented budget. And I think what I liked about it, it was very short and simple. Uh, no complicated jargons and uh, tax amendments. So that extent was good. But yes, the retrospective things like the faceless assessment or the reassessment or the cess, I think it's a bit unfair because you plan your activities in a particular manner. But then there are things like this uh, new SEZ legislation that they're talking about, which needs a major revamp. It's due for a major revamp. So yes, there is a good and the bad, but definitely it could be better. Thanks, Reno. Shravan Kumar. Yeah, I think uh, I think on a scale of ten, I think uh, seven on ten, I would uh, give only from tax uh, point of view. Some of the misses that I mentioned when I spoke earlier, I think that's the that's why I'm taking away three points in addition to what others have spoken about this uh, retrospective. Uh, and I definitely agree with Kayur when uh, he said that uh, you know we don't seem to be uh, able to take uh, uh, a loss, you know. Uh, actually, it's many decades old. Even Mr. Palkewala in his uh, budget speeches used to say uh, that that when a court holds the uh, stand against the revenue, you can be sure that it will be a retrospective amendment to annul the uh, decision. You know, so if this trend continues, you'll be able to guess what the next budget uh, amendments will be. List out all the cases where the government is losing. So that will be in the next budget as uh, amendments. And it should not happen like that. 
uh, I hope uh, this is the last of the things that we are going to see. Uh, but from if you but if you look at uh, uh, beyond uh, taxation, uh, I think it's a it's a fantastic uh, uh, budget uh, because of the uh, spend. Uh, I, I'm sure the multiplier effect, if not in one year, it, two three years, it will definitely kick in. I think directionally, it is a great budget. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Sean Kumar. Kalpesh, your take. And over and above oh. that, uh, one one more question I have for you. Is there anything for the common man in this budget? Is it really inclusive? Okay, so uh, let's first let's first go through the uh, common man issues. I think the common man uh, wanted a little bit more relief in a, in a short term uh, on a short term basis. Uh, that's what the common man generally has been expecting from a budget that some things will become, you know, uh, some taxes will go down for him, the slabs will improve for him, or at least some things will become cheaper for him uh, because the GST rates go down or some other rates go down. Uh, to that extent, uh, it's it's not been the budget for them in that manner. But uh, there has been a significant amount of uh, you know, the focus which the government has very clearly laid out in favor of the growth infrastructure, the multimodal transport, the, the Gati, Gati Shakti project, the 100 containers, uh, 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 100 container depots that she talked about. Uh, and therefore, there is a significant amount of uh, a push and capex that she is planning and she is therefore focusing in that direction. Uh, which should then foster more growth, more uh, jobs, therefore more opportunities, and therefore uh, more income, and therefore an ability to pay more tax. Uh, but long long term gestation, not a not a T twenty match, maybe a test match that will have to play. Uh, from a tax M and A tax perspective, I would think it's while we we had few misses, uh, we would have liked certain things to have to have been covered, but uh, no significant changes on larger tax items or tax matters, barring some, you know, some small procedural changes, reassessments, and and CES being retrospective is something which is some, you know, the the uh, M and A investors will take into their stride and they will move on. So, to my mind, I think it's a thumbs up. I would I would really be happy with this budget. Rashi, yeah. with your permission, we just want to add one thing. Please, please. Uh, somebody a little bit mischievously pointed out in the pointed out that the word "poor" has not been used in the uh, speech. Uh, you know, uh, so straight away the conclusion is it's a capitalist budget and all that uh, thing. But I think my my take is that uh, it won't be uh, pro poor budget just because you're going to give them some dole out or. Uh, you know, increase subsidies or uh, something. I agree uh, with my, you know, the guy who spoke to me um, uh, before. Uh, I think if uh, whatever we do, I think it should fuel economic growth and how. I think that's the only way you can help the poor of the country and not, not by any other means. I think all the ease of doing business and putting more money in the hands of corporates which create employment, etc. I think that that's the best way to do it. I think in that sense, uh, we have to give it some time to play out as you said, uh, refer to test match and not uh, T20. Yeah. Sure. And of course, uh, one cannot ignore the fact that you have two major states coming up for elections uh, in the next few months. And of course, this next year, the general elections are also up in quite a few states. So. Keeping that in mind, I think uh, one uh, can understand in terms of why everything has not been doled out in this year. Uh, that's my personal view. Um, but having said that, overall, yes, I agree. It uh, It is a rural consumption-driven budget. And that rural consumption, obviously, is not something that you're going to see immediately. It's going to take some time because the objective is to generate employment and for which uh, very clearly, this government has articulated that they expect private enterprises to take the lead as far as investment is concerned. So government has taken that step, but also the disinvestment and, of course, they're saying now it's for the private sector to step up and uh, take this forward. So on that note, uh, Dinesh, uh, there are uh, any question answers I don't see in the box. 
no open questions answered okay so the forum is open to any questions q and a uh, please feel free to post it uh, in there uh, or if you can just raise a hand and uh, you'd like to raise a question uh, ask uh, we can do that sandeep i don't see any questions yeah. So, I, so I have a I have question. a small question. Did anyone anticipate that in the election year and this, this, this most analysts are pointing at the semi-final that there would be no income tax rebates, SOPs for uh, the middle class at all? You want me to take it? You want anyone. anybody in particular? Anyone? Okay. Does anybody want to take that? Yeah. Uh, I think there is still time to do that in the next budget, I suppose. If if one were to do it, there's always, no, there's always a time. No, no, the reason I asked was that the next two budgets are going to be more crucial from the perspective of next year, there's going to be another semi-final because six big states are going for election. And then you would have really uh, the general elections coming up. So general elections are somewhere... Um, 24, right? 24. 24. Right, right. So, so this is where... I thought that you know most people were anticipating the working class, especially that there would be some uh, benefit which would come. Yeah. But uh, yeah, my question was: Did anyone? If I can, if I can take a stab at that, and maybe others can chime in. Uh, see, somewhere our assessment is that there has been some uh, conservative estimates that have gone into the revenue estimation by the government. Uh, That's because of the so, IPO is coming up, no? The disinvestment. The, disinvestment targets are also on a lower side. Yeah. So, so there is a room, Sandeep. Uh, for for the government to dole out those benefits in the next year, if they if they want to somehow uh, remain within the overall deficit and still achieve the uh, uh, the targets of doling out. From an economic standpoint, Sandeep, uh, uh, you know clearly the the common man was expecting. I think it was more the expectation was that this should have been more a consumption driven budget. Uh, the question really was had had that taken place or you know probably if there were announcements around that it could also lead to inflation and at this stage post pandemic given the fact that you're trying to put your global supply chain in place you know trying to um, ensure that your domestic manufacturing is strengthened and we're all there i think it's a balancing nice balancing act of first uh, let's get the rural consumption uh, uh, in place try to collect revenue because i was very surprised when i got to know this uh, on crypto trading, rural India, okay, is one of the, I think the topmost, uh, in, if you were to look at from a number of transaction standpoint or whatever. So clearly, um, yes, it should have, there were expectations and probably at least on some aspects, especially around, you know, when you talk about interest on housing loans, et cetera, could have been doled out because that could also have acted as a boost to the real estate sector. But I guess maybe they've got their numbers uh, all stacked up there. And uh, maybe that's something which they would want to dole out in probably stages as they approach the main uh, finale, which is 2020. Yeah, and, and uh, I, I also believe that uh, you know uh, this would be a phenomena where they would target once you are looking at the major metro cities where a lot yeah. of working class would be there. So yeah. Yeah. Punjab is not really or Uttarakhand. So, so, so thank you thank you everyone uh, you know it was uh, it was a very very interesting uh, uh, you know debate and uh, all aspects of the budget were covered uh, i think the only person who's really happy is shravan kumar <laughs> with uh, uh, you know what's uh, come for uh, industries but uh, i think this is, as most analysts have pointed out, all of you have pointed out that uh, they, the infrastructure is the main thing and that would in, in turn create a lot of positivity uh, going forward. So my, my, my thanks from Bombay Chamber side to all of you, Frank, Kalpesh, Renu, Shravan Kumar, Keur and Rajeshri for uh, really conducting this uh, debate in such a wonderful manner. My, uh, my uh, sincere thanks again to Tata Steel and Tata Consultancy Services for partnering us here. And uh, to my colleague Ganesh for uh, coordinating with all of you to put this together. Uh, all our participants, thank you for sparing time on a fr Friday afternoon. 
and I'm sure all of you would go back with much, much clarity, much more clarity than what you would have uh, as far as the union budget is concerned. Like I said, we do it every year, and uh, this is this is a tradition which the Bombay Chamber has been doing for ages now, and we will continue this tradition. Thank you once again to everyone. Thank you, Rajeshri. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to all my co-panelists. Thanks to my co-chair, Renu. Uh, thank you very much. And Kalpesh, Frank, Kayur, Shavan Kumar, uh, really appreciate uh, you taking time. Uh, and thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Very thank much. you. It has been a privilege. Yeah. Thanks thank all you. of you. All the very best. Bye-bye.